thank you all for uh, being here the last couple weeks. Um, last week, Aaron uh, brought a message that I was super excited for him to share. Uh, I told you guys a uh, couple weeks ago that that was something that was on his heart from man, back in October, I think. Um, and it was just super timely for us to take the last two weeks and just kind of remind ourselves of like the reality that, that this is not our home. Um, no matter what the world is doing and what's happening, we're not actually heading into exile. Like, that's how it feels sometimes. We're, man, we're on the precipice of heading into exile, and, like the worst season of our whatever, right? All of those things. And just to be reminded that, like, no, because we're part of the kingdom of God, we're actually in exile right now. Like, this is not our home. We're anticipating home to come. And so this reminder of, like, no, we're, we're supposed to be living differently, thinking differently, behaving differently, because this isn't home. And just to be reminded about Daniel and uh, the way that he lived in the midst of exile um, and to learn some lessons there. Well, all of that kind of leads us into what we're going to be studying over the next several weeks. We're going to look at the Sermon on the Mount. So if you got your Bible, pull it out to the book of Matthew or your device, whatever you got. Um, we're going to become very familiar with Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. Um, because here is where Jesus unpacks um, this message. Um, so we're going to do a bit of an introduction and the opening section of this message that he preaches. So we got to do a little background, a little context to help us so that as we jump in here, we don't, um, we don't take the message wrong. We, we want to understand it the way that Jesus intended it. And, and, and so why the Sermon on the Mount right now? Um, this last year has left so many of us spinning and wrestling with so many different things. And as a church, again, we, we want to kind of get back to basics, right? We're, we want to we want to remind ourselves about what this Christianity thing is really all about. And, and for us, as, as real, true Christians, like this faith thing isn't a game. Right? Christianity, our faith, uh, our Jesus, this is not a game. This is not just some cool meeting that we come to be a part of. It's not just a hobby. It's not just entertainment. It's not anything. It's not like we get to come and, and get filled with warm fuzzies and, and anything. It's not any of that. This is reality. This is everything. Like Jesus and our faith and our love of him and the kingdom of God is Everything. This is reality itself. This is eternity culminating. This is what it means to be alive and for life after death. And everything finds its meaning here in Jesus. And so I want to know what it means to be a part of his kingdom. Because the tragic reality is that, that we live our lives and we've been, we get distracted all the time in the midst of this life that we live. Right? There, there are so many things that vie for our attention. Shiny things, loud things, intoxicating things that, that dull us and blind us and distract us from the reality of the kingdom of God and our relationship with him and what it means to live in the midst of his kingdom. And in these moments, we, we like lose track of our hope and we lose track of like what it means to be a part of the kingdom. We get caught up in battles that are not our own. We get caught up in debates that are not productive. We, we become convinced of things that have nothing to do with the kingdom of God. We become contrary. We become bitter. We become all these different things that have nothing to do with what God has called us to be a part of in the kingdom. And this process is incredibly painful and tiresome and ultimately foolish. So we want to, we need to be reminded of what matters most. And at its core, the foundation of the kingdom of God is this. It's our faith and our life is all about the glory of the one true God who revealed himself in Jesus and came to bring the kingdom of God in its full. And our invitation into that kingdom and our participation in that kingdom and our sharing and inviting and spreading the kingdom is what life is all about. And that's what we're going to dive into. That Jesus came and announced 
that the kingdom of God was finally coming in the way that God had promised that it would. This is what Jesus comes and he begins to teach. He says it over and over in a number of different ways. Jesus says things like, the kingdom of God is at hand. He says, the kingdom of God is among you. He says, the kingdom is here over and over. As you read through the Gospels, this is the language that he uses. So now, as Christians, we're welcomed into this kingdom. And once a part of it, we begin living out this new kingdom reality. This kingdom we belong to has a new ethic. It has a new way of seeing life and people and everything around us. We see things differently than we used to. We live and function and think and behave, love differently than the way that the world does around us because we live according to this new kingdom ethic. Right? The king has come. He is alive. He rules. He reigns. He is God. And we are his people. And because of that, everything for us has changed. The world and earthly kingdoms sees a, a certain way, functions a certain way, and often it challenges our life. The way that we now in the kingdom live and operate and move and think. And the wrestle for all of us, then, is which voice, which way will we be drawn to? The ways of this world or the ways of the kingdom of God? And we've talked about this a number of times in a number of different ways, but the kingdom of God, it breaks into this world and it inaugurates this whole new way of life that we have been invited to live a part of. Because in the kingdom of God, things like social justice and financial planning and and responsibility and justice and equality and defense and sexuality, all of these very hot button issues in the world, they look and feel very differently in the kingdom than it does in the world. Yet here we are, a part of the kingdom, watching the world struggle with these issues in ways that the kingdom of God looks at very differently. And so over the next 10 weeks or so, we're going to look at Jesus' teaching specifically about what the kingdom of God is all about. What is this new kingdom that Jesus comes to bring? How does it function? What's it supposed to be like? What does it feel like to be a part of this kind of community that God has come to bring in its full? Today we'll start in Matthew chapter 4 and 5 to begin looking at all of this. Background. At this moment in Jesus' ministry, here's where we're at. Christmas, we celebrate his, his birth. So he lives, he's born, right? Mary Joseph, Bethlehem, flee to Egypt, back to Nazareth. Nazareth is where he lives and resides most of his life. He, he grows up, he works with dad, a carpenter's kind of job. He's, it's interesting because when we think carpenter, we often think woodworking. Possibly more likely, think stone. Most of the things in the ancient world, right, were made carved out of stone. So he was probably chiseling rock, hammer, like that kind of thing. Um, interesting. Could be either one of those. But bottom line, he is a hard-working man. And at some point, in, as he's grown up, right, we're told around 30, he begins his public ministry. He starts, he heads off to begin preaching and teaching this message of the kingdom of God. And as he steps out into the world to begin this process, how does it start? With a huge book deal, a huge signing? Does it, like, no, it's none of that. He goes off into the wilderness and is tempted and tested to see which kingdom he would build. Is Jesus going to build his own kingdom, or will he come and submit to the Father and build the kingdom of God that he came to inaugurate? Jesus submits to the Lord, says, yes, Father, you and I are one, so yes, I'm going to submit to you. So he comes out of the temptations, gathers the disciples, calls some men to come follow him, and he begins to preach. He begins to teach. And here in the Sermon on the Mount, we have his message. This is the message that Jesus would go all around Galilee, Jerusalem, all of Israel, beginning to teach this message. Wherever he would go, this is the message that he would bring. 
How does he begin? Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. This is what he says as he begins teaching these things. From that time, meaning he's coming out of the, the wilderness, calling the disciples, he looks to begin his ministry and says, From this time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay, so when I was in college, um, we had something called Cliff Notes. How many of you went to school and you're familiar with Cliff Notes? All right, so for those of you who are not, Cliff Notes are, you're given an assignment to read a literature book, right? You were, you were told to read a long book and you looked at it and went, nope, that's a day. And so you went to the store and you found a Cliff Notes version, which was about six or seven pages, where somebody else had read all of Shakespeare, boiled it down to like six pages and said, here's the key people, here's what you need to know, here's the themes, and now you're equipped to go take the test and get a C and pass, right? So hypothetically, that's what students did in college. Um, uh, now today, you can just get on YouTube and there's little like four minute videos of the same kind of stuff. I believe Matthew chapter 4, verse 17 is like the Cliff Notes version of everything Jesus came to preach. Like if you want to boil it down to like one statement, here it is. The kingdom of God is at hand, so repent. Repent, the kingdom of God is here. And the implication is we want you to come be a part of it, but in order to come be a part of it, you're going to have to repent. So we're going to need to unpack this word, repent. Repent, repentance, is this. The way you're living, the way you're thinking, the way you're behaving, the things you're believing, you're heading this direction, I'm going to need you to turn completely around and start heading this way instead. You thought you were right, you thought this was the goal, you thought this was the direction, you thought you were following God, you thought all of these things, but in fact, I'm going to need you to turn one and turn, and I need you to go the opposite direction. That's how wrong you were. But you thought that was the way, it's actually this way. So Jesus' call is, hey everybody, you're all wrong, but I'm going to invite you to come this way instead. This is his invitation. A message that was not popular in his day by the religious leaders to those who truly believe, I'm right, I have all the understanding, I, follow me because I'll show you the way. And a message still today that is not received well. Repent, turn from your ways, because the kingdom of God is here and not, and it's available for you. So come be a part of it. See, the truth is, for us as Christians, the life of a Christian is one of constant, continual, ongoing, ever-present, lifelong, am I making my point, repentance. Every day, in every way, submitting to the idea that, God, I'm probably not right. You are. And so I want to submit to your ways and not my ways. And see, here's the other thing. Repentance isn't just about like, okay, I'm going to stop doing something. It's about not only will I stop doing what I thought was right, I'm going to turn and I'm going to actively do something different. So, so this isn't just like, I used to take advantage of people. I used to see people as opportunities to better myself. I used to use people, take advantage of people, and now I see, through the grace of Jesus, that that's wrong. So now I'm actually going to seek ways to purposely be a blessing to other people rather than just use people. It's not just stopping the behavior, but it's moving actively the opposite direction. And we could play that out into all kinds of areas of sin that we find ourselves, but it's not just stopping. Sometimes we stop at that point. Man, I really need to stop doing this. I really need to just stop doing that. Well, let's replace it. Actively working towards the opposite direction. So here, Jesus is calling people to come into the kingdom of God. And, and, and what's going, on, going to be his primary way of calling people? Repent, is what he says. This is such a huge point. 
Jesus calling people to repent. Calling you and I to repent. You're not okay as you are. What a common theme we hear in our world. What a common theme that we hear all the time. You're wonderful just as you are. Jesus starts, hey, you want to come be a part of the kingdom of God? It begins with repent. You're not okay. You're not doing the right thing. You're going to need to change. You're going to need to rethink the way that you're thinking about everything. Yes, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Yes, you have dignity and value. Yes, you are beautiful, wonderful creatures. Yes, yes, yes. However, the way you see the universe is often wrong. The way that you look at other people, the way you, you want to react to situations, Jesus says, it's often wrong. Repent and come into the kingdom and let me introduce you to a whole new way of seeing the world and behaving in the world. This is the invitation to the kingdom of God. And so Christians are people who enter into this new kingdom, who submit then to God, I want to hear the way that you see everything, and I want to live out this new kingdom reality in the midst of a world that sees everything very different. Very different. Very challenging at times. But it's this call to come be a part of something altogether different. Now, as we get into this message that Jesus is going to lay out here, what we're going to see then is Jesus opens the kingdom up to everyone. That's what we're about to look at. Jesus calls all men and women, young and old, rich and poor, slave and free, Jew and Gentile, to come be a part of this whole new way of living. And this invitation that is open to all are all told, come as you are, but you can't stay there, you're going to need to change. Because things in the kingdom of, are very different. I've used this analogy before. I'll use it again. Um, it's like going to Disneyland. How many people have gone to Disney? Okay. Disney is a unique world. Uh, they aptly call it Disney World. Because as soon as you step into Disney, everything is different. Right? The way that you behave in Disney is very different than the way that you live outside of Disney. The food is different. The, the ways that you operate and move, the ways that you dress are very different in Disney versus outside of Disney. The things that are fun and captivating and wonderful in Disney, very different than outside of Disney. Like if, if some creature, fairy tale creature in a costume came jumping and dancing around me down my street, we would have problems. In Disney, this is wonderful, and I want your autograph. Like, that's very weird. But somehow, from here, and stepping into here, now all of a sudden, it's very normal. Some of you have gone to Disney and bought Mickey ears. I bet none of you have worn those ears to work. <laughs> Why? Because in Disney, this makes perfect sense. We're all wearing Disney ears. We all take ridiculous pictures. We come out of Disney, and the Disney ears are not only, like, not appropriate, but we're embarrassed. We wouldn't wear those to Kroger. Right? Welcome to the kingdom of God. Where life in the kingdom operates and functions very differently. And when you try to bring in ethics from outside of the kingdom into the kingdom, they don't work. See, like in Disney, we all know the rules. There's a line to ride the ride. It's a maze. It's a wonderful life. Whatever, like it's a long. We just figure out games to play while we wait in the line. And there's ways to to fast pass and all kinds of things. But if you try to bring an ethic from outside the kingdom into this kingdom, it doesn't work. See, outside the kingdom, I've learned that I can bully my way and coerce my ways to the front of the line. 
I can exercise my authority. I can say, hey, do you know who I am? I get first cups. I get a discount. I get this. I get this. Outside the world, that works. Try to do that getting on to Space Mountain. Some 16-year-old boy all of a sudden is like, sir, it doesn't work that way. You wait in line. And when you go, boy, I am four times as old as you, I will melt you right now. He just gets on his little walkie-talkie and goes, uh, we have a problem. And you're escorted out of Disney because that way of living, that way of operating that worked on the outside does not work here in the kingdom of, Earth, of Disney. The same is so true with the kingdom of God. When, when we try to take every issue that our world is struggling with right now, race relations, economics, justice, uh, education, everything, right? All of these different issues that the world is trying to figure out, and we become convicted about how they work in the world, and then we take that scenario and we try to bring it into the kingdom of God, it doesn't work. It doesn't function that way. And there's this dissonance and tension. And Jesus' invitation at the very beginning is, you want to come be a part of the kingdom of God? Wonderful. All are welcome. We're going to see it in just a second. But when you come in, you need to understand this. You have to repent. Everything that you thought was right, everything you thought was normal, it doesn't work here in the kingdom. Leave it at the door. Welcome to a whole new world. Welcome to a whole new existence. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 4, verse 23 and 25. <clears throat> Jesus says this. And he went through all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytic, and healing them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. So important point here. When Jesus begins his ministry, some of the other Gospels, like Luke especially, he speaks of how Jesus initially, he went to different cities and towns, and he would go to the synagogues, the place of organized worship, the place where the Jews and the religious leaders, where they would meet. And here was supposed to be the hub of God communicating his will for the world. And he went to those places, and he says, I'm here, I'm the Messiah, I'm the one you've been anticipating and the kingdom of God is here. Let me tell you all about it. And over and over and over, what happens? The religious leaders, they rejected it. The Pharisees over and over said, no, you're wrong. We have it right. We figured it out. And so here, what Matthew says is, so what he did is he turned from meeting in the places where, where the religious leaders were meant to be ambassadors of God. And he goes to the common folk. He goes to the hillsides, to the roads, to the farms, to where commoners worked and lived, and he went and he preached and he taught there. And as a result of this, all kinds of people were coming. Now, we were just given a list of what kind of people came. I don't know if you've ever been in, in a place where, like, People who normally in society are kind of looked upon. Like if you've gone like a place where all of the freaks just kind of gather, I'm no judgment, but I'm thinking like Comic Con, where everybody's dressed up as a as a video game character. I, I'm thinking in, in high school this would have been a, a like marching band concert or something. Like, because I made fun of those people, now my kids are those people, and God just has this wonderful sense of humor. Like, like in my head, like, all the freaks and geeks, right? And Matthew just said, hey, guess what? All the social freaks and geeks are just hoarding to Jesus. Everybody who the world went, and those people? Whew, 
No. They're flooding to Jesus. That's so interesting because what Jesus is doing is he's seeing the crowds and he says, I want you to know that the kingdom of God is for everyone. This is mind-blowing because all of these people who are flooding to Jesus, why are they flooding to him? Because the religious leaders who kick Jesus out are the ones who are saying to all of these people, you're not welcome. The kingdom of God is actually not for you. They use words like unclean, deplorable. They use words like uh, unworthy, unrighteous, unholy. So you can't come. You have to stay out there. And Jesus goes, perfect. I'll just go to them. And his message is, all are welcome. The kingdom of God is here, so repent. Let's see it. Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, it says, Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his, up his mouth, and he taught them, saying, I want you to picture this. The city, the town, the, the place of, of where culture is happening. Everything here flows out of the city, and they rejected him. So Jesus goes just outside the city. Up on a hill, and he camps out there so that everybody can hear and everybody can see, and he begins this message. And he begins sharing the very message that God meant from the very beginning. These religious leaders and teachers, influential people, had missed the point. God's point from the very beginning was, I want to bless the world, and I want the entire world to come and know me because I created you, and I love you, and I want to be in relationship with you. God's plan, right? He creates, he's in relationship with Adam and Eve. Sin enters the equation, breaks that system. Fast forward, we see through Abraham, God's like, here's my strategy. I'm going to have a relationship with a person who will become a nation. And through this nation, who lives very differently in the world, they're actually going to be so attractive to the world that the world will be drawn to them and want to live like them and know the God that they worship. This is how influential this people was meant to be on the earth. And somewhere along the line, they screwed it up. Just like you and I, we screw things up. We mess things up to where the temple, even the place of the worship of God was supposed to be strategically designed for mission, for reaching people, sections where men would study and hold each other accountable, sections where women would gather and worship together, sections where, where Gentiles, those who were outside, could be ministered to, poured into, all these different areas in the temple meant to come together as one to worship the one true God. This place of strategic pouring into people had become walls of division. No, you can't come in here. You, you can't even enter the temple. Oh, you're this? No, you can't come beyond this place. Oh, you're this? No, you can't come beyond this. Over and over. Walls were put up to keep people out rather than strategically evangelizing and ministering to the world. They messed it up. And God comes through Jesus and says, the message is still the same. All are welcome to come to me. But you got to come through me. So how are we to understand this invitation that Jesus is making? <clears throat> first, what we've been doing first is we're understanding Jesus' audience. This is so important, you guys. You and I walk through every single day making judgments on everyone we see, including myself. I go through the grocery store, I'm in the cars, and I am constantly, in my mind, belittling people, making judgments upon people, and going, you know what, man, they're less than, they're not attractive in these ways, that they don't bring me joy, and I make these walls of division constantly. We struggle with this, and Jesus comes and he's like, all of that has to go away. In the kingdom of God, there's no room for any of that because all are welcome to come to me. So you've got to get rid of this idea of like, there's us and there's them. Because for me, I want all of us to come. 
I want everybody to come to me. And Jesus here invites all the people that you and I, you and I, we would struggle. We would struggle with the people that Jesus invites. Because we go, Jesus, do you know what their background is? Do you know what they said the other day? Do you know what they did? And she's like, I don't care. I want all to come. I love that just before this, Jesus calls the twelve. And Matthew zooms in and goes, let me tell you a little bit about the twelve, the, the big dogs, the, the, the apostles who are going to follow Jesus. They're commoners. They're fishermen. The uneducated, overlooked, unclean, unworthy. And Jesus says to these, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, come follow me. Come follow me. There's room for you in the kingdom of God. Number two, we, we need to understand what his purpose in saying all of this is. As we approach these next verses, we have to understand that you and I have very American eyes when we read this. This section where we're about to read, um, they're about to say, blessed are those who are. Blessed are those who are. Blessed are those who are. And you and I, as Americans, tend to say, okay, then that's what I want to be. Blessed are those who are blank. I need to be blank then. Because I want to be blessed, so help me to be this. And that's not the direction Jesus is going. What Jesus is saying is, the kingdom of God is available to these kind of people. The blessed are. We call it the Beatitudes, and I hate that word because it implies we need to be this in order to be blessed. I, I wish we would rename this in our brains, the blessables. Blessed are those. This is, these are not things to try to attain as much as they are things that are indicators of who is welcome in the kingdom. We'll unpack that in a minute. It's like this. If we go back to the Disney analogy, um, it's like if I told you, hey, your ticket is free. And you're like, what, what do you mean it's free? Yeah, you just come on into the park. It's free. Go enjoy everything. It's it's all free. And you're like, no, 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 no. I, I'm going to need to pay. So so how much? Where do I swipe the card? i got to pay to get in here. I've got to do something in order to be a part of this kingdom. And when Jesus is, like, that's never, ever a part of Jesus' teaching ever, right? You're going to need to do this in order to be a part. No, Jesus is like, no, I paid the price. Welcome to the kingdom. In here, life is very different. So learn how to live in this kingdom, not of that kingdom. That's where we're going. And ultimately, it's for life change. It's not just for behavior. So let's dig in. Matthew chapter three or 5, verse 3 through 12. Each one of these are so powerful. Repent. The kingdom of God is here. It's at hand. So what's he say? To this crowd of misfits. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Just pause. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. When you and I take this as I need to obey this in order to be a part of the kingdom of God, now all of a sudden there's major tension, right? Because then we go, how do I become poor in spirit? And how poor in spirit do I need to get? And if I die, is God going to say, man, you were so close to being poor, like you were poor-ish, but not poor enough in spirit to be part of the kingdom of God. See where I'm going with this? Like each one of these are measurements that are unattainable if we read it that way. But when we rightly see the context that, that Jesus is looking over a crowd of misfits who have been told, there's no room for you in the kingdom of God. You can't come. And Jesus goes, no, no, no. Everybody can come. Repent. Change the way that you're thinking about what it means to be in relationship with God. Because blessed are you who are poor in spirit, who are overlooked, who are marginalized, who are looked over by the world. Blessed are you because the kingdom of God is for you. Man, this changes the entire tone of this entire message. He continues. Blessed are those who mourn, 
for they shall be comforted. Common teaching in that day is similar to things that you and I struggle with today. Why does life stink so bad for you, and why are you so depressed? Why is it that tragedy just follows you? Their conclusion? Because God must be angry with you. So those of you who are weeping and mourning over death and disease and broken relationships and struggling with everything in life that causes you to be in a place of deep mourning, they would say, mm, you must have done something to offend God. So there's no room for you in the kingdom because you're far from it. Us over here, we're happy and joyful and walking in the blessings of God. But there must be something wrong with you because you're weeping and mourning. And Jesus goes, no! Difficulty, pain, tragedy are a reality in life. But blessed are you. The kingdom is for those of you who are mourning, who are weeping, who are in distress over the condition of the world and your life. Blessed are you. The kingdom of God is for you. You're not overlooked. You're not abandoned. God sees you, and he wants you to come close to him. Verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Listen, the meek don't inherit anything. Like, if this is trying to attain something, the meek never attain anything because... Whether they're, they're meek because they have no power or because they're powerful yet choose not to exert that power and authority, they remain meek and subdued. They don't inherit anything because they would never assert themselves to get it. And Jesus says, listen, those of you who remain meek in this world, the kingdom of God is for you because God sees and he rewards in this life and in the life to come. There is a great reward for you, so come. There's a place for you in the kingdom. Verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. This is such a timely word for our culture right now. So many of us see the condition of the culture around us, and we long for things to be right. We long for there to be equality where people are treated well, where we're not judged upon economics, we're not judged on, on education, we're not judged on race or background, we're not judged by language or anything. We're, we're simply judged because we're, we're human beings created by God, and as part of the kingdom we see that, we're like, why can't you guys see it? We long for these things in our soul. And Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Why? Because you will be satisfied. That longing will be quenched. You will see it a reality. Where? So important. Where will we see it a reality? Where will it be satisfied? In the world? In the cultures of this world? No. Never. Where will we see it? In the kingdom of God. The world screams of equality. The world screams of all racial reconciliation. It will never happen in the world the way that they want it to. The only place it will be found is in the kingdom of God. Where all are welcome, no matter what. Verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. In our world, when you try to be merciful, what happens? When you try to be patient, when you try to extend grace, what happens? You are run over. You are run over. Right? Like at work, you don't assert yourself. Somebody says something, you're trying to be merciful. You're like, ah, they must be having a bad day. And it's like, no, they just steamroll over you because what the world has learned is I can put you down. And when I put you down, I look better. When I throw you under the bus, I get to promotion. And so here we are trying to be merciful to people in the world, and we're getting overlooked. And that's incredibly frustrating. And Jesus says, blessed are you who are merciful. Because you know what? In the kingdom of God, people who are merciful are actually shown mercy. There's a humility of those in the kingdom of God. This is the new ethic of what it means to be a part of the kingdom of God. Verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. 
that just again, if this is some kind of, I have to become pure in heart in order to see God, I have to become pure in heart in order to be a part of the kingdom of God, I'll just tell you as a preacher, I'm never going to make it. Because this heart is just as wicked as yours. And I am tempted and distracted and have proclivities towards all kinds of darkness that I wish were not a reality. And if I have to become pure in heart in order to become a part of the kingdom of God, it's never going to happen. But I praise God that he makes us pure in heart through his sacrifice, his grace, his mercy, his sacrifice on the cross. And he welcomes us into the kingdom of God and makes us pure. It's the good news of the gospel of the kingdom of God. Verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And if you want to know what's at the heart of God, it is peace. It is shalom, a beautiful Hebrew word in the Old Testament. Shalom, peace, means peace with God, peace within myself, and peace among humanity, and peace among the world. There's peace in every area of my life, and God says, blessed are those of you who are trying to bring about peace, because you are sons of God. You display the heart of God. He concludes the section with uh, verses 10 through 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you and falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they pure, pure, uh, persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus making it very clear, the invitation, come be a part of the kingdom of God, but here in the kingdom of God, here's what you need to know. It's going to run up against the world, and there will be friction. And there will be people in this world over and over again who look at you, and they hate what you stand for. They hate what you're trying to accomplish. They hate that you won't join with them in the way that they live, and are living a countercultural, very different kingdom ethic in the midst of their world. And Jesus says, blessed are you who try to live that way. There's room for you in the kingdom as well. Over and over, this is the message that Jesus preaches, that the disciples preach. We read through the book of Acts that they go out and begin preaching and teaching and sharing this message. And over and over and over and over and over again, what we see are people who are rejected by society, who don't fit along the cultural norms, are welcome to come be a part of the kingdom of God. Over and over and over again, God keeps surprising the Christians with who keeps coming into the kingdom. One of my favorite stories to illustrate this is from a, a man named Tony Campolo. He's a Christian man, a sociologist. He studies just humanity and how we live and think about a number of things. And he flew out to uh, Hawaii <clears throat> to speak at a conference. And here, one of the things that they don't tell you about taking a trip to Hawaii is it's, the jet lag is ridiculous, right? Like, I've not been, but I've heard from other people, like, that's a long trip, and all of a sudden, you're in paradise, and all you want to do is sleep. You're like, no, 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 I have limited time, this is amazing, and how do I do this? So Tony Coppola speaks about, like, he's, he's in Hawaii, but it's three in the morning, and he's wide awake. So what do you do at 3 o'clock in the morning in Hawaii? Well, there's only a few things open, so he makes his way to a diner, and it is the greasiest diner you've ever seen, right? Like, this thing doesn't seem to fit in Hawaii, but, but here it is. And as he's there, he makes his way in, and at 3 o'clock in the morning, who are the, the clientele that walk into the diner at 3 in the morning? It's all the ladies of the night who are just getting off of work. So here's this preacher, this Christian, in a diner with a crowd, people like 15 of them, like all just come in, coming off of work together. And they're crude, and they're talking about all the events of the evening, and how much they made, and all these things, and, and here he is. 
And he talks of this whole interaction that happens. You can easily find it on YouTube. I'm told he does an amazing job of telling the story. But he has this interaction before the girls come in with Harry, who is the, the cook. And he's gruff. And he's rough. And, and he orders a donut and, and like, a coffee. And, and he tells the story that Harry, like, gets the donut by doing this on his apron and grabbing the donut and putting it on the plate. And he's like, I don't know. I don't know if I want that. <laughs> really rough, right? And um, they have this interaction where they're like, you know, who are you? What do you do? And he shares that he's a Christian, that he's a believer in God, and Harry doesn't really understand this, and, and they go back and forth. Long story short, there's a woman who walks in, and uh, her name is Agnes. She's one of the ladies. And they're carrying on and talking, and Agnes makes a comment that, hey, tomorrow's my birthday. And the rest of the girls shoot her down. So what? What's the big deal? It's not a big deal. Like, it's just your birthday. Blah, blah, blah. We look just oversight, and she quiets down. All the girls end up leaving, and it's just Tony and Harry in there. And Tony says to Harry, Harry, have you ever, have you ever made a cake? He's like, I not much. He's like, Harry, what do you say we throw Agnes a birthday party tomorrow night here? And Harry's eyes lit up. What? What are you talking about? He's like, didn't you hear Agnes? She said, like, tomorrow's her birthday. We should throw her a party. Like, it'd be great. We can surprise her. She'll come in, and, like, we can have the whole place decorated. And Tony begins unpacking, like, what they can do. And Tony just says, like, I'll go get a cake, you know, because Harry wasn't super enthused about it, like me. And, Tony, and Harry's like, no, 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 no. I'm making a cake. We'll figure this thing out. We'll make a sweet cake. It's going to be amazing, right? And Tony's like, okay, I'll go get all the decorations. So they make this plan. The next night comes, 2 o'clock in the morning, and they, here's Tony Capolo hanging, you know, just like, travels the world speaking, hanging streamers and balloons at a crusty diner in Florida, anticipating that these prostitutes are about to walk in. And Harry's in the back, finishing up, writing Agnes, double-checking, spelling, and like, all these things, right? And the girls come in, and Agnes walks in, and they all yell, happy birthday. And Agnes melts. Like, she can't speak. She's shaking because she doesn't know what to do at the moment. And everybody's trying to, like, gather her. Yeah, come over. We're going to sing happy birthday. And they all sing happy birthday. And, and she comes over to the cake. And they're like, cut the cake, Agnes. We want to cut the cake. We want to. Harry made this cake. This is amazing. And Agnes pauses. She goes, would it be okay if I just took the cake just for a minute? I promise I'll bring it back. Like, my family, my kids have never seen a cake. Like, can I just take the cake home? Show them, and I'll bring it right back, I promise. And, and they relent, and she carries the cake off. And Tony says, as she left the door, there's just this hush over the room. And Tony said, it just felt like the only right thing to do at that moment was to pray. And so he he just prays with a room full of prostitutes in here. <laughs> prays that God would bless Agnes. Thanks her for thanks him for her life. And he gets done with the prayer. And Harry is just like, what the heck is going on? What the heck is like, I don't know a preacher like you. I don't know, like, this is so weird. What is it that this is? And, and Tony just gets to say. This, this is the kingdom of God. This is what the kingdom of God does. The kingdom of God throws birthday parties for prostitutes and prays to God for their blessing. This is what the kingdom of God is like. And Harry says, I want to be a part of something like that. Man, we have got church so messed up, don't we? Where, where we think this is the kingdom of God. Where we come and we worship and we 
gather around people like us who think like us and go, no, this is, this is what it's like. And Jesus comes, and his invitation is, all of you who are overlooked by the world, the kingdom of God is for people just like you. And in a time where we are so incredibly divided, not only as a nation, but even those who call themselves brothers and sisters in Christ are so divided over so many things. What we've done is we've dragged all kinds of issues that are not ours into the kingdom of God. And it's so tragic. We, we've got to get back to, and this is where we're going over the next several weeks. We're going to look at Jesus' message. And we need to rethink. We need to repent. So we've got to get back to the heart of this. Because I didn't belong in the kingdom either, and he welcomed me in. He invited me in, and I'm a mess. And I need to keep that same mentality for everybody else around me. The people who drive me crazy, the people that everybody else takes advantage of, the people I am quick to judge, the kingdom of God is for people exactly like that. And so if I'm a part of the kingdom of God, my job is to be an ambassador of Christ and to welcome them in. Come, be a part of the kingdom of God. The worship team comes up. I'll close with just one verse here. This message went viral. And Jesus and his disciples and the writers of the New Testament, they went and they taught this message. Paul says something really powerful, just as one final reminder of this. He says this in 1 Corinthians 6. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Those who don't want to come to be a part of this, those who say, no, I'm going to live the way that the world does, Jesus says, okay, the, the kingdom of God is not for you then. If you don't want to repent, if you don't want to become a part of this, then, then it's not for you, right? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexual immoral, the idolaters, the adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And we pause there, we stop right there, and we go, yes, it's us versus all of them. We've got it right, they've got it all wrong. And we're clearly told here, the kingdom of God is for us and not for all of you. And the next verse is so powerful, we forget it. He says, and such were some of you. That's exactly who you were. You were on the outside. You were those who were not inherit, and yet God extended the invitation to you as well. And you used to be like that, but you were welcomed in, but you were washed. You were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. That still is the hope for us and every single person on the planet, that you can repent and come to Christ. It doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done. You are welcome in the kingdom of God, but it's going to mean repenting. It's going to mean changing, because the way that you're working out here doesn't work in here. So... I, I cannot wait for us to go on this journey together as we repent because the kingdom of God is there. And as we share this message with everyone around us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your message here. The message that is at the very heart of what it means to be your follower. The message, God, that, that was, has been repeated for, for 2,000 years plus. That the kingdom of God is available to everyone and anyone, regardless of how I feel about it, regardless of how we feel about it, God, you are welcoming every and anyone to come to you. We recognize that means we have to change. We have to change the way that we think and act and move in this world. We can't act like that in the kingdom. It's very different in the kingdom. So God, over the next several weeks, as we unpack this, as we study together, God, help us to change the way that we see life and reality. We get distracted, God, by so many things. Help us to see what the kingdom of God is like, what, it, what its ethics are, what its core foundations are. God, we already know it's about love. It's about love of you, love of others, and mirroring your heart. So God, teach us. Instruct us. 
We submit, we repent to you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.